So, Pat Churchland, UC President's Professor of Philosophy at UC San Diego. Wrote a seminal book in 1986 called Neurophilosophy. And most recently, Brainwise, and has write, recently been writing a lot on choice, responsibility, and the basis of moral norms. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to uh, do this fairly quickly because the afternoon is really moving on. So, so I'll just move along, and um, perhaps then in, later in the discussion uh, we can uh, expand a little bit. But obviously, many sciences are going to contribute to the naturalistic uh, task of trying to understand what it is about us that uh, makes us social. Now, every year when I'm at Beyond Belief, I talk about the voles, and this year is no exception. Um, but really, my interest in morality was, was sparked as a result of uh, the discoveries that were made by neuroscientists about the neural mechanisms for attachment. Hitherto, of course, neurobiologists had models that told us something about altruism, but I really wanted to, to sort of wait until we could see uh, what neuroscience might be able to offer. So let me just remind you again that there are various species of voles. Some are largely monogamous, the prairie vole. Some are largely promiscuous. Um, of course, it has to be said that even though the prairie voles are largely monogamous, the males do, as the English say, like to better get a bit of crumpet on the side. And I guess we now know from Sue Carter's work that the females like to get a bit of, shall we say, stud muffin on the side. But they do, they do like to live together. The males nest guard, and they share parenting, and that's very different from the montane voles. Um, now, the, the basic finding, and of course the story is actually very rich, but the basic finding concerns the density of receptors for vasopressin and oxytocin for vasopressin in the nucleus accumbens, uh, sorry, for oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens and for vasopressin uh, in the ventral pallidum. And the behavior changes in a very dramatic way if you block those receptors and all of the various controls are done and that's how we know that that is the crucial part of the story. So then the question has, uh, has arisen, well, do you see uh, anything in the human case that might tell us something uh, about the nature of the role of oxytocin and vasopressin. Now let me just briefly say that we do know quite a lot actually about both of these things and what I'll say here is going to be confined to oxytocin. In animal studies, I'll get to the humans in a moment, but in animal studies one of the things that's really very interesting is that as the oxytocin levels go up, then there is a decrease in activity in the amygdala and in the brainstem structures. And behaviorally, what you see is a decrease in defensive postures, such as freezing and fighting and fleeing. Um, and you see a decrease in autonomic arousal. So oxytocin really functions as a kind of safety signal. So animals, when their oxytocin levels go up, as they do, for example, in first mating, or as they do with prairie voles when they just kind of hang out together, um, it functions as a safety signal. They feel comfortable. Uh, they don't feel threatened. And that feels good, by and large. Um, of course, oxytocin is important in uh, delivery. It's also important in lactation. And we know, again, from animal studies that it's very important in uh, parent-offspring bonding. Now, it turns out also there are studies of the effects of the lack of uh, comfort and cuddling as uh, for human infants. And if, if there is a lack of comfort and cuddling when humans are infants, they tend to show poor social, uh, st stable sh social, I'm trying to do this too fast. Uh, <laughs> uh, they don't tend to form good long-term relationships. They have social problems of one kind or another. And in a rather heroic study, it has been found that, in fact, their oxytocin levels in sort of normal interactions with friendly, uh, familiar people are lower than they are uh, in controls. Now, all sorts of experiments have also been done where what you do is spray oxytocin in the nose and goes up through the olfactory bulb and into the system. And it's known that trust levels increase 
for example, in the investor game. Um, but it's also been shown in human studies using fMRI that you see a comparable decrease in activity in the amygdala and also in the brainstem. And consequently, we, we do see a, a great similarity between uh, what happens in animals and what happens in humans. So like Sam, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to think that there are facts about values. And in particular, I'm inclined to think that the uh, second group of existentialists that Owen talked about, who said that the world itself is meaningless or valueless, and that we have to create value, that they were really quite wrong, that we're all born with these systems that are very deeply into the values business and that values are much more fundamental uh, than many of the things that moral philosophers uh, tend to talk about. So the basic point is then that social attachment, and I think, as I'm going to s explain, that social attachment really constitutes the biological platform for morality in general. That, uh, what we know is that social attachment is mediated by amongst other things, oxytocin, vasopressin, the density of receptors, but it's also mediated by dopamine and the endorphins, and there are probably other things uh, that are involved as well. So the fundamental hypothesis that I want to suggest, and I think this might fit with Sam's picture of the moral world, is that attachment and trust are the anchors of morality that we feel these strong bonds to children, to mates, to kin. And in the case of humans, of course, this can also be expanded beyond the immediate group. And that these strong bonds, and we feel them throughout, um, are tuned up by the reward system so that we are sensitive to particular local practices and conventions and we come to acquire, at least in the human case, but also I think in some animals, we come to acquire concepts like honest, fair, kind, friend, foe, and so on. Um, like all concepts, these are radial concepts in the sense that they have prototypes that are in the center, and then further out uh, there are examples that are a little more uh, controversial or hard to classify, and the boundaries are fuzzy. So it's not like there are necessary and sufficient conditions for being honest. Rather, it's that there are certain prototypical kinds of cases that we teach children, we all agree upon, and then there are cases uh, that are further out. So between them, uh, the um, attachment and trust as regulated in the way I describe, and the reward system, I think what you've got is the motivation to do problem solving. And, to, and, and I guess I really do need to have a place in here for the, for the mirror neurons. It's just that I, I don't really think of the mirror neurons so much as a mirror neuron system as just part of the way the whole shebang works. Uh, but that's a slightly different story. But, it seems to me then that, that humans, like other social animals, wolves, bonobos, uh, baboons, we have a powerful motivation to solve complex problems about how to get along. And that much of morality really does, and this is not new, this is just old Aristotle, that much of morality really has to do uh, with problem solving. And problem solving, and this is something that I, I think I acquired by thinking about computational issues in neuroscience for a long time. I think problem solving, and hence this wider idea of reasoning, really is a constraint satisfaction process. It's the way that neural networks settle on solutions to practical problems. Sometimes those practical problems have to do with the physical world and how to get on, build a bridge, catch a bear, and what have you, sometimes that they are, uh, they are moral, uh, that is to say social problems. How to deal with a certain problematic person or how to distribute goods in a way that will maximize well-being and stability. And as Sam said, there are better and worse ways of doing that and sometimes local conventions can override the good sense about 
the better way of distributing uh, a resource. And, and then maybe that will change over time, uh, but maybe it won't. The constraints then in the social domain that go into uh, a constraint satisfaction problem are going to include things like these powerful urges to be together. We're anxious when we're not with those people who, uh, to whom we are attached and we feel good and safe and comfortable when we are. Other constraints will involve immediate perceptions. The concern for reputation, and this came out uh, I think very well also in Jonathan Glover's talk and Jonathan Haidt's talk. But there will be other emotions and drives, there will be memory, and there will be the powerful force of habits as mediated by the reward system. How exactly neural networks handle these complex constraints such that they settle into a solution is still to some degree an unsolved problem within computational neuroscience. But reasoning has to be something like that. What we're pretty sure most reasoning isn't is deductive logic. Maybe I use a bit of deductive logic like maybe twice a week, not counting logic class. But most of the rest of it is this complex constraint satisfaction process. So morality then from the biological perspective, the fundamental platform is oxytocin, vasopressin, and so forth, gets tuned up by the reward system. Choice is fundamentally constraint satisfaction, and somehow out of that, the story of reason and the way in which certain habits of reasoning, and I do think of them as skills and habits, rely on past experience and impulse control. Social decisions then, I think, are multi-brain constraint satisfaction problems where some solutions are better than others so that uh, trial by your peers turns out largely to be better than trial by ordeal. Let's see, I think I just want to finish in this way. Um, I greatly admired uh, Sam Harris's point that you know, we are all fed this story about how you can't get an art from an is, and facts are one thing, and values are the others, and norms are one thing, and descriptions are the other. And maybe we ought to kick those tires once in a while. And so, in the context of this sort of a talk, someone is always going to say, yeah, but you can't get an art from an is, and blah, 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 blah. And does that mean that the desired is just the same as the desirable? because maybe it's the case that uh, a certain culture at a certain time uh, desires something like uh, uh, boiling the firstborn and feeding it to the dogs. Does that mean it's desirable? And of course, one wants to say no. And I think we do kind of understand why that's the case and that we don't have to get all ooshy about oughts and ises and so forth. And the desired is not the same as the desirable because there can be conflicting goals, even within oneself, but of course uh, within the community. Um, there is also ignorance of the future, and so sometimes, depending on the degree of uncertainty, uh, what we may have to do is rely on the wisdom of the elders, or we may have to rely on a trusted and true, uh, so to speak, solution used in the past. And the other thing, of course, is that desires change over time. I used to really like candy when I was a little kid. I don't actually care for it much anymore, and so forth. Um, but the, the really salient thing here, and I think this is part of the story that's behind what we talked about in the context of eudaimonia. What's desirable is not independent of what humans do in fact desire. Now, that doesn't mean there's a simple relationship between what we do, in fact, desire and the desirable. It's going to be complex. Um, but it can't be the case that they're unrelated. So what our brains do care about fundamentally does shape our ought space, the ought space that we inhabit. And this is really reflected in how we organize our institutions, change them sometimes, change our laws, Re reorganize our social behavior 
and, and in a certain sense aim for some kind of improvement, even though we often may have the conception that we're doing better, uh, only to discover uh, that our social experiment was not so good. So what is the relation between what is and what we ought to do? And my answer, uh, again, very fast, is that it involves this complex current of feelings, desires, memory, prediction, impulse control, time pressure, and it lands us in an ought minimum. That's how it looks to me from a biological point of view, which is different from the point of view of, so to speak, uh, folk psychology. And I'm just going to leave it at that because I want to make sure there's enough time for the rest. Thanks.